Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, whatever the case may be for you. And welcome to this chat with the International Coalition of Crohn's. We're very excited you're here with us this evening. Um, it's evening where I'm at, so I'm just gonna say evening, it's easier. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, very honored that you're here. We're moving through this chat in a little bit different way, just so that y'all know. So if things look a little weird sometimes or something for some reason, we've decided to record these chats now with just the three of us instead of doing it with a live audience, which has been our norm. So that's what we're used to. So this is new to us. So if we get some weird looking stuff, it's just because we're trying to figure out this new way. We are going to premiere this though, and that way we get to watch it with you. And then afterwards, we will have a uh, after chat, as we call it on Zoom. There will be a um, link. <laughs> There's the word I was looking for, for you to join us. Okay, so let me introduce myself. I'm Essence Catheris founder and one of the Crohn's of the International Coalition of Crohn's. And thank you again for joining us. Ariane, would you please introduce yourself and say hello? Hi, I'm Ariane. I'm from the far north of Queensland. And I'm just going to say straight up, I'm going to apologize. The gardeners outside mowing the grass. So if there's weird noises when I'm talking, just turn them off, please. Um, I'm super excited to be able to be doing this in this way without the live audience and and very interested to see how it happens and hope you are all joining us for the after chat afterwards thank you kobaha good evening everyone hello uh, my name is kobaha i'm an intuitive spiritual facilitator and crystal therapist i live in northern arizona uh, near sedona so on my side if you hear big bang it's basically monsoon season here we've been having rain thunderstorms every single day so yeah that's the only disruption the disruption i can think of um otherwise thank you for joining us tonight it's another packed chat very interesting information and i hope for some of you you can look at the information from a different perspective over to you essence Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, Kabaha, I'm glad it's raining there, Kabaha. They've been having a lot of major fires out there in Arizona. So yay for monsoon season. And since the other two crones um, always share, I, I never think of it, to be honest, where they uh, reside at on this planet. Just for the record, I'm in the piney woods of East Texas. So here we go, everyone. Let's take just a few minutes for us to all come together and create that wonderful, loving, sacred space that we're going to be working in this evening. Uh, we do that by, I share and read a couple of the Metatronic Numerology IM keyword phrases while we simply sit in a meditative state with the intention of opening up a sacred space within which to work. So if you would join us now in creating that space, we would be honored. Simply take a deep breath and exhale slowly, releasing all the tensions of your day, everything that might get in the way of this sacred work. The first Metatronic numerology I am keyword phrase I would like to share is what we call the heart of the IKOK. It is the 2266 dual frequency. And it says, I am the master of divine balance. Through the remembrance of the singing of the sacred cosmic song of self, I ignite creation of new realities. I am that which rebalances and heals. The next I am keyword phrase is what we call the four cornerstones of the work of the IKOK. -okay. It is the 2277 dual frequency. 
And it says, I am the form of the sacred structure of collective reality known through the awakened divine rational mind. I build reality upon the foundation whose cornerstones are honor, integrity, responsibility, and expansion of sacred perspective. I am the master builder of collective galactic realities. In this moment, I would like to share and let it be said that I, Crone Essence Catharis, we, the Crones of the IKOK, hold no answers that can be considered 100% nothing finalized. What we do hold are perspectives and possibilities. What we share, the information we share, the teachings we share, once shared, become potentials. And with that, we're going to begin want to um, tell everyone, let you all know that in this chat, we're going to be talking about what it means to be an empath uh, and how to control your empathic abilities instead of letting them control you, how to take control of the empathic abilities that are that so many star seeds and light workers possess that often overwhelm. We're also going to be looking at energy work. What is it? How do you do it? Um, and how is it connected to your empathic abilities? I wanted to share before I turn this over to, um, was it Kabaha? <laughs> I know we saw it. <laughs> They're laughing at me. I'm going to make them unmute so they can, you can hear them laughing at me. Um, before I turn, but anyway, before I turn it over to one of the other crones to share some uh, information and knowledge and wisdom that they have to share, I want to share this. We each have to become the source of stability continuity and continuation. If we desire to be a part of creating the effects of growth and expansion of consciousness for the collective, but especially those things are so important. If we want to affect positively those closest to us, meaning in closest to us emotionally and closest to us physically, Okay, we have to become these anchor points of emotional control, of stability, control of our thoughts, and doing this continuously so that we create an, an energy pathway of continuity and continuation, something that's undisturbed, unbroken, that others can follow, that shows a pathway more clearly because we all understand right now especially and I'm sure you know we say that I was going to say we understand that right now especially things on this planet are in a upheaval turmoil <laughs> chaos um a little more than normal, I would gonna, I, I'm going to say. But, you know, as, as I was beginning to say that, and what I'm going to jump back to is I'm just almost sure that in every generation, there are points that, by comparison, might not seem right now as chaotic, as uh, big a turmoil, as troublesome as this global pandemic. But in that generation... I'm not sure that they were any different really energetically. 
We need to be, we have to learn to be as empaths, as star seeds, as light workers, as all of these terms that we use in this belief system. We, our job, if you will, okay, our sacred work is to better ourselves, to become all that we can be, to stand in our power so that we can be these anchor points of stability, continuity, and continuation. And with that shared, I'm going to turn this over to Kabaha and let her share what she yes. has. To do with you. Nicely put. Totally Thank agree. Yes. People who are empathic are very sensitive to everything and everyone, everyone around them and have often been told that they are too sensitive, particularly throughout their childhood. It took me many years way into adulthood to recognize that from a very young age, I was like a sponge, picking up and absorbing energy everywhere I went. I remember feeling many overwhelming feelings. What struck me the most was that I often felt sad when I thought I should be happy and vice versa. My feelings made little sense to me. I thought I was weird and just wanted to be like everyone else. Because of family circumstances, I used my empathic abilities from a very young age. I was a good listener, but it was at a cost. I felt stressed, emotional, and suffered from being overwhelmed. It was a huge responsibility for such a young human being. I was very sensitive both physically and emotionally. I had my feelings hurt easily, but I had also unusually mature insight for my age about the world, <clears throat> excuse me. Another sign was I needed a lot of alone time and I was very shy. When I tried to be myself, people told me I was too sensitive or I wouldn't understand, but I understood. Adult problems were very real to me. Sometimes they consumed me, especially when I was a teenager. It was only in my early 20s that I felt I could not cope anymore being an empath. It was too much for me. It felt like a curse. I had to move away from my family environment and spend a few months by myself in a foreign country. During that time, I learned so much about myself. Being an empath is a fantastic gift, but if you don't know what you are dealing with, it can feel like a curse. It's hard to know what you feel because you are feeling things other people are feeling too, not just your own emotions, which feelings belong to you and which belong to someone else. Before I started exploring, my passions and what I wanted in life, I felt like I was living someone else's life. What I didn't realize was that I was living someone else's life because I couldn't sort out my own feelings. I started living the life I thought was expected of me. I was living my life based on earning approval from others, my family and my friends. I desperately wanted to fit in. And so I started acting how I saw other people acting. In 2000, after coming back to the UK from a two year stay in France, I realized this was not working for me. I had a great job working for a multinational company, but I had to come back to the UK as my then husband at the time accepted a new job offer. I felt lost but I could feel my soul was craving for something else. So I asked myself, what made me happy? I could not think of something specific. How could I not know such a simple thing as what made me happy? That should be an easy question, right? So how do you go from being this person who feels what everyone else feels to decode your own feelings and learning what it is that you want. 
start by learning about yourself so you can recognize when you are taking on another people's emotions and where they are your own. Here are a few ways you can do that. I first heard the expression, don't shoot on yourself from a friend. It's the pressure we put on ourselves when we think a certain behavior is expected of us. If you hear yourself saying you should do X, Y, Z, then there is a good chance that's not something that will bring you happiness. Of course, there are some shoots that may be necessary. I should get some groceries or I will starve. But there are other shoots that you can cut out of your life. I should go visit grumpy old Trish. Really? Is that something that will bring you joy or are you doing it out of obligation? When people ask me what I did for fun, I often responded with hang out with friends. But when I thought about it, that wasn't fun, always fun. I have a lot of fun hanging out with myself. But who wants to hear that? When you are an empath, you need to spend time alone. And that's okay. It's one of the best ways to recharge your batteries. And it's an opportunity to reflect on your feelings without other energies interfering. Be honest with yourself. If you don't enjoy something, that's fine. Stop doing it. The times when you feel truly happy, remember them. Record what you are doing. This will help you figure out what your go to happy activities are. When someone asks you what you enjoy, you'll have no problem answering. It's difficult for some people to understand the quirkiness of an empath. It's okay. We're all different. If you understand yourself, then it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. When you know yourself, you gain a special confidence that's freeing. It may take some time to get there, and that's okay. Be gentle with yourself. Some things come to us little by little. If you have spent your whole life living by what's expected of you, it will take time to get to know yourself. The important thing is that you explore that. Being an empath doesn't have to be a curse. The more you learn about it, the more you can embrace its gift. My spiritual awakening allowed me to learn how to control my empathic abilities. It was not easy. It took me years. I feel it's very important for empaths to have strong boundaries of protection in order not to eat up the negative energy from the people and the world around them. Empaths often find it challenging until they learn to control their empathic abilities. I believe that recognizing that we are empath is the first step in taking charge of our emotions instead of constantly drowning in them. Empath can have incredible compassion for people, but they often get exhausted from feeling too much unless they develop strategies to safeguard their sensitivities and develop healthy boundaries. Compassionate people often have positive traits like gen generosity, kindness, and understanding. People who are compassionate feel the need to impact the world around them in positive ways. I have been reminded on a few occasions that we have chosen an extraordinary time to be here on earth to assist in the healing and expansion of human consciousness. Yet, in such turbulent times, it's important that we practice compassion with detachment more than ever. For many of us, it's not easy being so open and sensitive to the needs and energies of the world. Like sponges, our energy fields are porous and prone to soak up the energies of others. And because we take in the buildup of negative energies of others, we often feel compassion fatigue or empathy overload. Practicing compassion with detachment shows us a broader, more spiritual perspective on life. It opens up the intimate space 
of relationship so we can connect with the expanded dimension of our being and the beings of another. The practice of compassion involves empathy, which leads to a relationship between equals rather than sympathy, which leads to a relationship in which one person feels sorry for the other. Being compassionate toward others does not require us to engage in any unhealthy physical or emotional experiences they may be having. In fact, compassion requires that we remove ourselves from the physical process and instead support from a place where we feel stable and empowered. We can communicate that we love a person while still refusing to play a part in that drama. To hold compassion for others is a wonderful and beautiful thing. It is a virtue we must possess if we want to do our part in the ascension of the collective consciousness of humanity. In order to be in a place of compassion with detachment, we first need to control our emotions. If we can't control our emotions, we simply can't do positive and effective energy work. Empathic abilities and energy work are going hand in hand. The energy work technique that works for me is the use of crystals. As I explained in the last chat, crystals, stones, have a very small electrical charge within their structure measurable with the correct instrument. Within each of our bodies, we all have trillions of cells with its own tiny electrical charge. If something is wrong with a particular part of our body, something has disturbed the electrical balance of our cells in the affected area. Microscopic electric charge from a crystal, when held or placed on the affected part of the body, will balance the, body, the body's own charge and help to give a chance to our body to heal itself. Crystals attract and release energies. They are like, at the same time, a transmitter and a receiver. When you place or hold a crystal over the body, it interacts with the body's chakras and promotes physical and mental wellness. Used in a certain way, it can also improve your concentration and creativity. It can also promote physical, emotional, and spiritual cleansing. Working on the high heart chakra can help an empath. There are many crystals that we can use for the high heart chakra, like kunzite, apophyllite, green kyanite, green calcite, clear quartz, among others. I believe by connecting with the high heart chakra, we can learn to understand and work with compassion. This is where we learn the true meaning of the term compassion with detachment. The high heart chakra connects the emotion of divine love, compassion with detachment, truth, and forgiveness with the area where language originates, allowing us to speak from the heart. Opening the high heart chakra supports the processing of higher energies and the integration of an immense flow of spiritual energy in and through our physical body. As this chakra becomes balanced and open, higher spiritual levels of awareness are accessed. There is a strong link to the divine as well as love and aspiration for the divine. Selfless, unconditional love is also an attribute of a balanced and healthy high heart chakra. When compassion is awakened, the desire to heal is strong. Working from the high heart space is a healthy way of relating to others, which lets them know that you have a loving and caring concern for their predicaments, while holding the belief that they have the ability to deal with their own problems and become responsible for their own issues. At the same time, you make the effort to maintain a sense of detachment about the outcome. We are taking on our responsibility out of a sense of love and not out of a sense of obligation. The important thing here is to stay detached so that you don't step in and attempt to resolve their problem 
their pain or their issue for them. It doesn't mean, however, that you care any less for them, nor does it mean that they and the outcome are not important to you. By being in that place of compassion with detachment, we truly begin to be more of assistance in the healing of others and our self. I shared extensive information in previous IKOK chats regarding the work on the high heart chakra. If you are interested, please watch the IKOK chat dated May 7, 2021, titled Expanding Your Comfort Zone from the Inside Out. Still re related to crystal energy, I also carry on a daily basis a piece of black tourmaline. Black tourmaline is an excellent crystal for everyone, especially empath, because it's the bodyguard stone that provides protection and elimination of negative energy. Black tourmaline crystal properties work like a sponge, soaking up all the negative energy that surrounds it. Through absorbing negativity, the stone can prevent unwanted energy from entering your mind, body, or spirit which gives this stone its protective quality. Because of its powerful ability to clear negativity, black tourmaline is also a key component in everyday cleansing rituals and can help to release any unwanted energy already stored in your energy field. Black tourmaline is also a powerful grounding stone. As an empath, Becoming grounded is the most important way we can learn to stay centered, slow our body's rhythm, learn discernment and transmutation of energy and simply live a happier and healthier life. In drawing life to us in a way that feels trusting and calm, the world around us reflects that same energy most of the time and we begin to feel more empowered and less at the mercy of the world around us. It took me many years to finally understand how to use my sensitivity to help others change their lives without depleting my own energy. In order to serve as beacons of change, we must take care of ourselves first. Emotional intelligence always requires being empathic with ourselves. And that, paradoxically, allows you to be even more present for people who need help. The ancients knew that empathy, compassion, and loving kindness need special protection. Over to you, Essence. Thank you. <laughs> My unmute button didn't want to work. Uh, Wow, thank you. A lot of great information there. I want to um, very quickly kind of scan over uh, an article I wrote back in 2013 um, entitled Thought, uh, Compassion with Detachment. And uh, just to, it, it's the same basic information that Kobaha uh, has shared here, but, you know, sometimes just so slight different perspective twist kind of like come into different individuals. Uh, I, I want to, uh, so in that, let me just kind of like skip through that. I have it up on the computer over here. Uh, emotional sensitivity is directly, this is from my article in 2013. I've shared this several times. You can go to my website and find it. Anyway, emotional sensitivity is directly related to compassion. There are different types of compassion and different levels of compassion. Compassion from the level of the human existence is tied directly to our ability to be empathic, just like Kabaha was talking about. Emotional empaths often have a very difficult time until they learn how to control their empathic abilities, just like uh, Kron Kabaha and everyone else. I know I did, you know. Okay, compassion from this level, the human level, is often overwhelming and brings us to tears and causes us to say yes. This is kind of one of the points I wanted to share a little bit. To people in circumstances, we usually would not, leading us to become doormats. In other words, it leads us into hooking into their dramas emotionally and energetically. 
why do we do this as in as empaths? Why do we do this? Well, we think we're doing this, okay, when our uh, empathic abilities are not under our control, when they're overwhelming us, we think we're doing this to help the other person when in all honesty, we're doing it for ourselves. We're doing this because we feel others' emotions and the emotional frequencies of everyone around us. And we're constantly being bombarded with emotions that aren't ours, just like Kron Kabaha talked about. We feel these low frequency emotions of others' dramas and personal issues, and it just becomes too much to bear. So we end up saying yes to helping others beyond what is productive and beneficial, not only for our growth, but for their growth as well. We're not doing it for them. We think we are, but we're not doing it for them. We're doing it for ourselves because the pain, the emotional pain has become more than we can tolerate. And it's like, okay, fine. I'll just do anything to make this stop. Okay. That's that overwhelming empath empathic ability. All right. It is a gift, but it's not a gift until you learn how to work with the gift. Okay. Like Baha talked about, this is compassion. This level of compassion is born of the heart chakra, all right? And don't get me wrong, we have to have this level of compassion, but it's just the beginning point. And it's a, it's a virtue, but it's the beginning point. It's the compassion of the high heart chakra that Kabaha was talking about that is much more in line with what is known as divine compassion. And this is where we need to learn to understand and work with compassion so that we can really understand what this compassion with detachment is really all about. I want to uh, mention here too, if you're not familiar with Global Coherence Initiative, that's another really great place to look at just learning about energy work, okay? And how it's related to compassion, all right? And your empathic abilities, because the heart radiates an electromagnetic field, just like Kabaha was talking about those little electrical charges within every cell of our body. Okay. The heart itself actually radiates an electromagnetic field affecting each other's emotions as humans. Okay. Our attitudes and our feelings, our moods, whether we're conscious of it or not. All right. And to be perfectly honest, the closer we are in physical proximity to a person, another human, the more it affects us. This radiates out a lot further than you would imagine that it does. But I guarantee you that if you are within six feet of another human, because that's about the uh, average um, width, if you will, of a healthy uh, auric field, human's auric field, you're really going to pick up on them. This is why alone time is so necessary for clearing your energetic field. All right. So just trying to, you know, look at this a little more. I'm going to use the word scientifically here. Okay. Even though Kabaha touched on that. All right. Com um, com we talked about compassion of the high heart. Kabaha talked about that a lot. She shared a lot of information in this chat and previous chats, just like she mentioned on working with uh, activating the high heart. We've talked about that and it is imperative. If you, you want to get your empathic abilities under control, if you want to control them and use the gift that you have, instead of being overwhelmed by it, you have to, there's no choice. You have to do that. All right. I want to share one of my, and this is in the article uh, that I've shared numerous times. I said, one of my favorite lessons and quotes on compassion is from the book, Patah, The Gift by Jannie King. In it, Patah shares the following on compassion with detachment. It is this, as you grow in awareness and expand your consciousness, you will find that your view of your world also expands. As you view the dramas and pain and anguish of your brothers and sisters, it is important that you balance detachment and compassion. It is to be in that place of support, open-heartedness and unconditional love, to show forth tenderness and giving of yourself without becoming hooked into the story, without reinforcing feelings of victimhood or powerlessness. That is compassion with detachment, 
All right. One of the things, okay, so let's talk about, you know, talking about this, how do you learn to control your empathic abilities? All right, we're going to talk in several different points here, but one of one of the very first things that I think is very important is you need to learn, and this is also in the article I wrote, to allow others the right to experience the journey of awakening they're creating for themselves upon the path of human life without becoming attached to the dramas and low vibrational frequencies their negative emotions create. We need to learn. You've got to learn that although you may think what you're doing by taking on their emotional pain is helping them. It's not, you don't have, first of all, it's not your job. You don't even have the right. I mean, now really think about that. You do not have the right to try to fix someone else's problems. You're meddling in karma. You are meddling in life lessons. Now, that doesn't mean like Uncle Baha talked about, that you can't care. You do care. You care very much. But you've got to learn to simply be that, what was that when I spoke of when we started? We have to learn to become the source of stability, of continuity and continuation. We have to be the anchor points showing this clearer pathway. You cannot do that if you do not have your empathic abilities under control, all right? You don't have the right to take on. Do you have something you want to share, Kabaha? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I know, I know what some people are going to say. They said, well, if you deal with family members, I do agree. And it was my case. Okay. It was a family member. And that's why it took me so long to come to a point where I thought, no, I can't do it. And I had to give advice to the person, to them, to go and see a psychologist because it was coming to a point where, yeah, I couldn't cope with it. And as you said, doesn't mean, of course, I did still care for that person, okay? But in my defense, I did my best. But it is tough. If it's a family member, I do agree. It is tough. But at the end of the day, you you are the priority too. You're there to do some guidance to a point, but at the same time, you need to protect yourself. Right. Compassion with detachment will be one of the hardest lessons you ever learn in this lifetime. One of the hardest growth lessons okay that you ever master because compassion with detachment is being able to control your empathic abilities all right stand in your power show caring and tenderness and support without becoming hooked into the dramas in other words you have to learn how to maintain your energetic emotional mental and spiritual balance while everything around you is chaos. And that is like Kronka Maha just said, especially difficult, the more emotionally attached, okay? So the closer we are feel emotionally to an individual, the harder that is. The hardest thing you will ever learn is to maintain your balance, your energetic balance, and not let the energy of others around you disrupt it. It, 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 it is, you know, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. What it means is you have to be committed to doing it. You have to understand and you have to not beat yourself up, which is what Chrome Baha was talking about. Excuse me, my tongue got tied there in learning that you have to be empathetic for yourself. Okay, you have to allow for your humanness, let's just say, okay? We need to learn that although we may think we are helping others by taking on their emotional frequencies, which is what we are doing when we attach to that energy, their dramas, okay? We're actually adding to theirs and our unhappiness 
like attracts like you're at, we're actually feeding their energy when we take it on and it is expanding okay when you take on the emotional pain of another into your personal energy you are feeding exactly what you desire to ease this is counterproductive for them and for you um there's um let's i'm kind of scrolling through here uh, and see oh the other thing i want to mention here let's see moving into uh, experiencing this high heart level of compassion is an energy often referred to and known as compassion with detachment and it is quite a strange experience for us as humans when we first find ourselves there because it's so different than what we're taught we're supposed to be and feel like just like Kron Kabaha was talking about when we first enter into this space of love we do change often so dramatically and here comes kind of another like oh crap really another problem let's just you know say it tongue-in-cheek that way when we first enter to, into this space we do change often so dramatically that sometimes we're misunderstood because others many times start seeing us because we change because suddenly it's like oh i can care i can maintain okay and be this point of stability but you've changed how you react and so others especially that know you well are go well what's the matter don't you care anymore why why don't you care why are you being so aloof that will they what i've written here because others do many times see us as being aloof and uncaring but this truly is not the case we've simply learned or beginning to learn to hold a level of compassion equal to that of the masters. This is the compassion born of the high heart, not the human level of compassion born of the heart chakras. Okay, um, I, I'll share a link in the write up to this if anyone wants to read the rest of that. So, but we're going to move on um, with that. But I just wanted to share a couple of little, you know, extra points there. Like I said, uh, I, I really do suggest a little bit of study in a global coherence initiative where you learn about that um, literally the heart radiating out an energetic field. This is measurable by scientific devices, okay? This is not just woo-woo energy work as some people might, you know, call it. All right. Um, Ariane, are we ready? Are you ready to share or? Yes, I'm ready. The gardener has gone. Okay. <laughs> oh man, he was noisy. He's right up to my window. Okay. But I have well, a nice day. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thank you. That was excellent, excellent information. And I remember going through all of those lessons with you over the years. So thank you. All my life. For as long as I can remember, I've been overwhelmed. For most of my life, I believed it was because of my upbringing, which was in the time when children could be seen, but most definitely were not to be heard. It was confusing. Adults and other children around me made me feel befuddled. They made me fearful. They overpowered me, overwhelmed me with their very presence, with the noise that they made too active, too strong. And I didn't understand that it wasn't actually their physical voice or activity or their muscular strength that overpowered me. It was far stranger than that. Some people could overpower me simply by looking at me and make me devolve into a tear-filled mess. The noise that humans make hurts me, even now in certain circumstances. Not physically, it's more of a, a mental disturbance. It's hard to describe. And as a child, I had no means of reference to say that this pain which hurts my body and this pain which hurts my soul were any different. I had no guidance to know that it wasn't always physical noise that hurt. Now I know that it's the chaotic, jumbled energy noise that so many people put out that hurts so much. 
Like many others, I had no one to guide me. And so I learned avoidance. I already knew because of my upbringing how to disappear into the wall so that I couldn't be seen or heard. But I also learned how to disappear into storybooks, how to travel to different realms. My own way to describe it was to go visit the elephants. Basically, I leave my body and go where I felt safe, on the open savanna with the elephants. I'd walk in their footsteps. I have a guide, Emily, who is a big blue matriarchal elephant. I have a picture up here on the wall, and she is always there within range of the places that I spend the most time. She makes me feel safe. I learned how not to be there where my physical body was. It was the only way I had at the time to control my environment. When I got older, I used food. I was anorexic. But that tentative control was violently ripped from me one day when I was caught up in riots. Now I understand that it wasn't just the physical noise and violence of those riots, but it was the energy of anger, of fear, of death, of dominance, destruction and hatred. That energy whirled around in a maelstrom of violence that I couldn't handle. I doubt that anybody could really. And for over 20 years after that event, I lived in fear of everything outside my front door. I had zero control of anything that happened outside my front door. And it took that long for me to be diagnosed with PTSD. Time moved on. I learned how to deal with panic attacks that happened every day. And especially whenever I went into a place where there were a lot of people. My need to escape the pain that I felt was so great that I actually became violent and I'm not a violent person. I've been thrown out of more than one McDonald's for actually going to thump someone, winding up to thump someone who was simply talking loudly. Time moved on. I learned coping strategies and life continued and it was even fulfilling at times. Then, totally out of the blue, in the midst of a time when other dramas were playing out, I was accused of something I hadn't done, something I hadn't even been involved with and I was threatened with jail time. My world was already very delicately poised, but with this phone call, it totally collapsed. This was in August, 2014. In October, 2014, I had what I call my initial spiritual awakening experience. And in June the following year, Essence came into my life. There have been many times when I've stated that she saved my sanity and I'm deadly serious about that. Finally, someone was able to explain to me what was happening, what was experiencing. At 60 years of age, I found out about empathy. Of course, I knew about empathy as opposed to sympathy. But I didn't know that empathy could also be an amalgam of our senses a deeper sense, a response to the energy swirling about in the world around us. I didn't know that people are empathic in this way of sensing those energies around them. I found out that I am empathic and that every other human on this planet has that ability to some degree or other, if they're open to it. It's a matter of sensitivity. Most importantly, I learned that it overwhelms when you're not in control. And I most definitely was not in control. I never had been. I finally discovered that all this pain and noise and drama and the associated overwhelm and everything is because I am very sensitive to the energy of what is around me. Essence taught me I can learn to take control. And that has probably been the most important part of my journey through this lifetime. You really can't learn to control how you perceive and receive the energy around you until you learn about how it works, how energy works, and how to work with energy. Because you can't just flick a switch. You have to learn about it. The very first thing that I needed to learn, and I see so many people out there who are in overwhelm through their empathic abilities, the first thing we needed to learn 
was how to stop seeing all this energetic swirling as something to be feared. Essence told me that if I could learn to take control instead of it controlling me, that this knowledge of the energy of the world around me could become my greatest gift for helping others. Now I am driven to help others. And this could be an amazing tool. I had to change my mindset, my beliefs. I'd had 60 years of fear and hiding from something that could be my greatest asset. But it wasn't something that was going to be learned overnight. Essence got the ball rolling with the, the sort of things she was just mentioning before. But eventually my guides directed me to attend a weekly meditation circle in the town where I lived. People there were lovely, committed, helpful, caring. But the energies they moved in were already too low a frequency for me to feel comfortable in. Now, I know that sounds like ego and, you know, like a case of, hey, my frequency is higher than yours. That's very definitely not the case. It was simply that they worked in fields that operated in different frequencies than those I was starting to work in, working with Essence. I went there to learn skills that I did need. Primarily, I needed to learn how to trust what I know. I'm clairsentient, claircognizant. I needed to learn to trust that and to trust the energy that I was able to read. And how did I do this? How did my guides learn to trust that? I learned the art of psychometry. I have to say, I was pretty hopeless with reading the energy of personal items, such as jewellery. They feel inert to me. But my psychometry teacher would put a photograph in an envelope or face down on the table where I couldn't see it. And I would hover my hand over it. I wouldn't touch it. But I'd attempt to read the energy that I felt about whatever was in that photo that I couldn't see. I'd be feeling how many people, how many, whether the picture was in a wooded area or a city or whatever, I would read whatever I could out of it. And to do that, I had to push myself out of my comfort zone and learn to say what came into my knowing without doubting it, without second guessing it. And I was in a safe place because there were other students learning this and there was not a whole, there was a wide range of skills, let's just say. There's a lot of people who had no skills, but they were playing, having fun. And no one ever made anyone else feel stupid, regardless of what came out of their mouths. We were all just having a go. And I learned to relax and say whatever popped into my mind. And surprisingly, that information was uncannily accurate. It was a good class, fun, great people. And every single week for the 18 months or so that I went to that class, I left that class, got home and vomited. Every single week after attending that class, I spent hours throwing up. Now. To be fair, I do have a certain number of food intolerances and vomiting isn't really that unusual for me when I eat certain food chemicals. And so week after week, I was just thinking it was something I was eating. Until I was invited to visit the local spiritual church. I went into that church and immediately felt that really familiar draining of my energy that I describe as pain. This was a place of very low frequency. And I was in that position in my learning of starting to be able to recognize and understand it. When I had to rush out of that church in order to throw up, I knew exactly why I had been throwing up for the previous 18 months. However lovely the people were in the class I'd been attending, the energy they were working in was too low for the frequencies I was learning to move with it. And when I mentioned this with my psychometry teacher, she confirmed that she too had recognized that I'd soon be leaving to follow my own path. This is a really good way for me of understanding that you can't separate that physical from the spiritual. When you're working with energies that are not the norm for you, you either have to learn how to deal with them and to adapt, or your body will tell you that you need to do that at least in my case. Now, most of this time, I had lived in an apartment building that had the most horrible, swirling, chaotic energy. 
Next door was an even bigger apartment building that held energies that were even more intense. I had a lot of drama in my life too, and it came to a point when I had to move out. I was the fourth successive manager of that building to have had a mental breakdown. That's how bad it was. I had an amicable separation from my husband and moved to a town several hours drive away and everything calmed down, but it was great. But on the 1st of January, 2018, I found myself back in that building after getting a call for help in running the resort. I knew what I was getting myself into and in self-preservation, I should have said no, but no, I had to go help. Despite already having had several years of learning to recognize and understand how to read the energy and at a basic level, how to work with it, just eight days later, I found myself on the beach, seeking a passive way to lead this life. That's how badly I was being affected by that energy in those buildings in just eight short days. I went into meditation and beseeched the universe to either take me or to show me how to bring balance into my life. Balance is what I got. I fell off the seawall, had to be rescued by the fire service, had two stays in hospital and four and a half hours of surgery putting my leg back together. When I came out of hospital, I had to go back into that place of swirling, painful energy. I had no option. I had to spend nine weeks in bed with my legs stuck up in the air, trapped in that energy, unable to escape. I had to learn to recognize that energy and learn how not to let it take control of me once again. I had to learn to choose how I worked with it. Otherwise, those nine weeks would have destroyed me. I was severely tested. And I don't need to go into all the details, but it was bad. It was hard. And it was there that I came to understand that me being in control of the way I perceive and work with the energies around me or of allowing these energies to control me as they had when I was younger was all about choice. Choice and discernment. I had the ability to choose how I saw, felt and reacted to the energies around me. And in order to make that choice, I had to be able to discern what was beneficial and what wasn't. And believe me, not only then, but in the three years since that accident, I've been severely challenged. Does this mean I'm now fully in control of my empathic abilities? No, not a chance. I think I will be learning and growing in this area for a long time yet. What has happened is that I am learning to use that energy in the way that Essence told me I would be able to. I now view this ability as the true gift it is. I use it to see my world as it is and not so much as how it is presented. I use it when I have a client, either for Reiki or drum healing or as counsel. I use it within meditation for the benefit of the entire collective. And it's impossible not to work with energy when working with essence. One of the things she first taught me is that everything is energy, energy, frequency, vibration. She told me to tattoo it on my arm. It took me a while to get there. And I did have a fall over a couple of days ago, but generally I think I've got a really good handle on understanding that. I'm getting there. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And I hope the sharing of my journey helps you to better understand your journey and not be overwhelmed by the fears of uncontrolled empathy. You can work to learn to live and deal with it. Thank you. Essence. Thank you. Thank you, Ariane. That, that was a wonderful share. Thank you very much. Um, I think what... I would, oh, excuse me, my nose decided to itch. Um, uh, some of that energy. Uh, <laughs> I would say there. Some of that energy. You can't so separate much. the physical you're, from you're the spiritual. You're muted. I can't hear you. What'd you say? I said that, that 
knows you can't separate the physical from the spiritual. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, that energy of control. It is tough. No one said it's not. It's not, you know, it's always going to be tough. You know, um, there's a, a, a saying that um, I like and known for using quite often and is the true test of a master is not that they never fall down. It's how quickly they get back up. I fall almost every day. Just like from Arion, you know, um, chasing a four-year-old and four dogs and a cat. Yeah, I fall almost every day. <laughs> you know, um, but it's okay. But the thing is, just like Ariane was saying, you are in control if you choose to be in control. It's a tough lesson. It's study. It's work. There's no magic bullet. There's no magic pill. There's no magic, beautiful switch to flip that turns on psychedelic uh, lights, okay? That makes everything beautiful. It's work, it's work. You have to be committed <laughs> or you'll be committed. Oh, I really like that one. <laughs> yeah, okay. Wow, a lot of information, a lot of amazing sharing, a lot of heartfelt sharing. Thank you both. Wonderful, both of you, so, so much. I want to, we're going to go ahead and, and move into other stuff. I know, and, you know, y'all jump in whenever, you know, if you got something. Remember, we're trying this new uh, way out. Um, so, so you're an empath. Great, wonderful. You know, you can, once again, choice. You can either, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go back to that little, you know, funny I just made. You can either commit to taking control of it, or you can be committed because you didn't, you know. Um, I'm, I'm hearing this is interesting I'm, I'm going to see what this is where this is kind of I'm hearing move move in the minute move in the moment allow the moment to talk okay it's talking about the empathic empathic abilities oh they're saying stop trying so hard Okay, stop trying so hard. Okay, you know you're empathic. You, you know, you, you, we've just shared a lot of information about what happens if you do and what happens if you don't. Okay, you've got your own experiences of what happens if you do and what happens if you don't. We're sharing some basic concepts and ideas and knowledge and wisdom on, you know, how to take control of it, study. Okay, learn, learn its energy right there this is how em empathy and energy work are related you have to do the energy work because you have you have to learn how to do energy work proficiently because that's how you stop being manipulated this is what they're saying by the energy the swirling around you because the energy is not going to stop swirling there are over 7 billion humans on this planet right now headed for eight really fast okay plus there are the emotions of animals plus there are the emotions and the thoughts and the energies of every grain of sand every blade of grass every star in the heavens as we say the energies are not going to stop swirling they're meant to swirl so learn to move in the moment with them. That's what they're saying. Learn to move in the moment. You are a part. You are a part of the swirling energies that create this reality. 
Stop fighting it. Allow yourself to move with the energies in the moment. And yes, that even means some moments, hopefully less and less and less as you learn to control better control of your empathic abilities through learning how to work with energy, frequency, and vibration. But in those moments, you are human. You are going to have those master moments when the master falls. Plow it. But don't wallow in it. Get back up. Keep going. Go, ah, crap. Okay. All right. I got this now. Here we go. Move with the cosmos in the moment. Move from where you stand. Be, this is interesting. They're actually showing me a, a point of stability that is flexible and flowing. Because if it's even a point of stability, like we talked about in the beginning, can become too rigid. And when it becomes too rigid, what does it do? It can't move in the moment. And the same, same concept that they were always taught about, be like the willow who bends in the wind and not like the oak who breaks in the wind. This may seem sort of esoteric, but if you understand energy, Allow yourself to literally just move, just literally physically, because you cannot separate the physical from the spiritual empath. You want to learn, you want to take that first step in learning how to control your empathic abilities, get up and move your body, get up and move your body and allow it to flow in the moment with the cosmos. Okay. That was that message. And it's perfect. And I was thinking while you were saying that and sharing that message, I know for a fact, and I know a few empaths who are very nervous every day to get out and face situations. They're just nervous. They're just, you know, it's there. And you're absolutely right. Just go out there, embrace the flow of energy. Okay, we're going to be tested, but that's part of that life journey as a human. And get, guess what? That's fine. We're learning. But not being scared and worried every time you, you can sense, oh my God, I'm going to, oh yeah, that person clearly have problems. I can sense the energy. And you start being rigid, uptight. No, no, go out there, do, do your job, do your work, relax. Yeah, uh, that made me think of those nine weeks I spent in bed in that room, in that building with the most horrible energy around it. My point of stability, I was actually the bed. It was my, it, it had to become, it could become my prison or it become my refuge. And I couldn't actually dance. I'm a dancer. I couldn't move out of that area. I couldn't dance with the energies. I was, I was constrained there. So that choice, that first choice I had is, do I view this as a prison or do I choose to view this as an opportunity? And I made that conscious choice that it was an opportunity so I couldn't get up, I couldn't walk around, I couldn't dance. I started crocheting. I worked on my creativity. I made wigs for people with cancer. There's always someone worse than you. I, I took that time and turned it from a potential prison into a period of opportunity. And that's your choices that you make in these energies. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, related to what we've just shared right here, I, what I'm gonna end when we get to that, this chat with, I, I just kind of want to reference right here um, and it, it, it comes back to this, what we're talking about here, okay? 
Um, let's see. I want to share. Um, I know Kaba or excuse me, Kabaha. I'll tell you what. I know because I know Ariane has got something else she wants to share, and then I've still got some information I want to share about specific. Uh, we we want to talk a little bit. Kabaha has already talked about some specific types of energy work. And that's with using the stones and crystals and things like that. And that's what Ariane uh, wants to share, uh, something she uses and you know that others use. And then I have some information that I'm gonna share uh, related to that same thing. So let's go ahead, but Kabaha, let's pull a card. What do you say? Let's let's just see what message Good idea forward for us. Okay, so tonight I've selected the moon deck. So let's let's ask spirit. Very much related to the empath. What sort of advice? What message? I'm going to get. Oops. Well, that's it. <laughs> Just drop one shuffle and dropped. Okay. Well, I'm not surprised actually. Okay. Are you ready for it? Healthy boundaries keep me centered and balanced. I mean, come on. Uh, perfect. Sorry. Let me, let me get it back to you. No, no, that's fine. I, what should I add? I mean, as, as, as an empath, we have to set healthy boundaries. It's essential for our physical, emotional, you know, well-being. Mm -hmm. And I'll come back to what I shared early on. Okay, it's not being selfish. Think about it. You can't help people until you can, you can help yourself. You are the priority and it's not being selfish, right? No, right. You, if you want to be that point, a point of stability, you know, you cannot be emitting chaos all the time. It just it just doesn't work. Wow. Perfect. I just love it. One shuffle, bang. Okay. <laughs> um, let me see real quick before I turn this over to you, Ariane, if there's anything that I feel like I need to share first. You know what? I'm going to share this real quick this is it's just kind of short and sweet especially for me <laughs> um this was actually a message that came through on the 10th of this month i'm just going to share i'm being led to share it so i'm going to share it okay sometimes i think that truth is simply knowledge in flux consciousness in motion for even as we experience life we study learn grow expand we are constantly recognizing newer more expansive levels of knowledge and truth for every point of light which is nothing more than the manifest form of consciousness that we gather unto ourselves our individual self, mind, and heart, the two parts of our soul, if you will, the yin and the yang of our shen, we tap into another version of truth, an expanded awareness of the wisdom of the universe, of the Tao, of the cosmic knowledge that is accessible to us for the simple reason we are but a fractal expression of the Tao, of the universe, of the cosmos, manifest in physicality within this reality. And as I contemplate on why I felt drawn to share that message that came forward in what kind of seemingly might seem to many not connected to this empathy and energy we're talking about. 
I, I see the connection personally. I see it as a reminder of really almost going uh, going back to this move in the moment because you, me, the other two crones, every, once again, every human on this planet, every animal, every blade of grass, every star in the heavens is a fractal portion of this reality. And that is truth. Um, it seems to me in this moment that that is a message of, to say it in uh, our current vernacular, lighten up. Quit taking everything so serious. You know, enjoy life. Stop seeing only the fear. Make the choice. This is what I'm hearing now. Make the choice to stop seeing only the fear. Make the choice to stop ingesting and feeding yourself daily with the energy of fear, misunderstanding, miscommunication. And instead, spend that same time those same moments in this universe that you exist within, that you are a part of in focusing and seeking the joy and the bliss. Lighten up, human. Lighten up. Ariane, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, sorry, I thought it was still unmuted. <laughs> oh dear, it's a fun day today. My favorite way, <clears throat> sorry, of working with energy is with my Sami shamanic medicine drum. And I wanted to share this with you. Uh, the Sami are reindeer herders. They're the last tribe of nomads in Europe. And when I heard of a man living in Australia, where I am, who is Sami and who make drums, I was sort of intrigued. So I've made medicine drums and I understand the potential that they hold. So I gave him a call and we chatted for hours as he told me his history, how he started his drum making apprenticeship when he was just eight years old and that he's now in his 60s and has been making traditional sacred drums all his life. He told me everything about his drums. It's all naturally and sustainably sourced. There's no chemicals or glues or dyes or bleaches used. The skin and the wood don't come from commercial sources. The skin is hand scraped and cured in the same traditional ways that have been used for thousands of years. Every wooden pin is hand carved. There's 24 of them in my drum. Every single aspect of his drums are built with the knowledge, prayers, and songs of the sacred work that that particular drum will perform. So in our talk, I was quizzed as to how I proposed to use one of, his, one of his drums if he decided to make one for me. I was being interviewed to make sure that I was going to be a worthy guardian of such a drum. And he wanted to find out more about me so he could dis dis decide what would be the right one for me, the shape, which woods would be used, what skin to use. I use my Sami drum as a diagnostic tool. I almost always start a session with the drum and it doesn't matter if it's Reiki, EFT or cancelling. The drum comes first. Why do I do this? Well, it helps the client relax first and the vibration that comes back to me after it bounces off the client's body gives me so much information. Empathically, I'm reading the vibration, the energy. I was taught that there are only four rhythms to a medicine drum. One beat, two beats, three beats. You got it, four beats. I start at my client's crown with a soft, slow, gentle one beat. I do a pass over the body from head to toes and back up again. 
If the client's lying down, I do a similar pass down each side. If the client is standing, I work down her back. That initial pass tells me where things are unbalanced. Then I bring in the two beats, the beat of the earth's heart. Often the client's own heart will sink with the drum and they start to really fall under the influence of the vibration. You can see it and feel it. The back of the drum faces the client so they receive the full force of the vibration as I travel around them with a backward step so that I don't cross that vibration. I increase the volume, move up to three beats, then four beats. And that's almost a constant beat. I increase the depth of the beating and I'm still moving up and down and around the client's body. I have my eyes closed and I'm walking backwards around the client and I know exactly where the client is. The drum is roughly four to six inches away from the client's body, yet never touches or moves wider. I can feel the energy of the client through the tone and the vibration. I know where there is pain, where there's a blockage, where something's missing or inflamed. And it's only in writing this that I'd have ever even thought to try to describe what I feel with this knowing. I feel the gaps. I feel areas that are flat, sharp, grey, hollow. That's the best way I can describe it. There's um, a hollowness when someone has had a hysterectomy, for example. Arthritis is sharp like broken glass. There's a strong resonance where there's health. I can hear the change where there's ill health. The vibration loosens the energy. Clients have released tight held emotion. Tumors have shrunk, pain abated. I've not ever had a client who felt nothing. They absorb that vibration. It soothes and it swallows the pain and it pushes the pain outside of them where I can sweep it away into the earth. People return from the drumming as if they've been in the deepest of meditations. It's a slow return and there's always a pause when the drumming stops, before a breath is taken and before the eyes open there is an exploration of self. It may be momentary but it's there. The knowledge is within the client that there is more than just this human body. And me, I too am a part of that. And that's why I love working with my Sami drum. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. And a, a wonderful tool. And that's, you know, what we're, we want to share now. And that's what I'm getting ready to share. Um, a little bit different, some more um, energy tools that have come forward for um, the work that um, I do and we do is the IKOK related to, and if you're not familiar with this, uh, I suggest now it be a time to go back and listen to uh, all of the IKOK chats are in the playlist on my YouTube channel. Uh, go back and listen to... Um, the chats talking about um, the 1788 ATKI, the collective dark night of the soul, you know, all of these things like this. Okay, just to kind of catch you up. I want to read this. This, this is interesting. Now I know why this came forward uh, literally just a few minutes before we got online to start this chat. And this is what I've written. I'm just going to read it. It says, this may seem unconnected to empathetic abilities and learning to control them. But believe me, it's very connected and important to learning to control your empathic abilities. What is it I'm talking about? It's temperance. No, no. What exactly do I mean by this? Temperance in its modern use is defined as moderation or voluntary self-restraint really what we've been talking about with the choices and the learning to control the energy 
Why is it important? First of all, this is interesting, I believe. Temperance is one of the six virtues listed in the positive psychology classification, included along with wisdom, courage, humanity, justice, and transcendence. To have temperance means you are consciously deciding to take responsibility for being moderate in your actions, thoughts, and feelings, your emotions. You are consciously controlling yourself in all things and acting, thinking, and participating in compassion that can very easily lead you into the energy of drama. That's that low frequency compassion we're talking about. In other words, you're learning to control it. You're learning to recognize it with your temperance. When you lighten up, when you move in the moment, you flow with the universe, okay? When you practice temperance, you practice moderation in all things and you become responsible for you. So, like I said, that came forward just moments literally before I was, yes, ma'am, go right ahead. That, that's really interesting. Many years ago, I trained as a nutritionist and I was shown all sorts of different diets and weird and wonderful things like eating half a grapefruit and your fat will melt off you. And I decided to make a stance. I decided in my practice, it was going to be all things in moderation. If you wanted a Mars bar, have a Mars bar, but just know that, you know, it's going to have an effect all things in moderation. And as you were saying that about, you were using those exact same words, and I'd never actually put something that's in my day-to-day -day life, all things in moderation, into that spiritual concept. And that was really enlightening. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's like all things, you know. Everything, things. including grapefruit and Mars bars. Grapefruit, Mars bars, um, the woo-woo stuff the you know the all of it all things in moderation and let's yeah. remind ourselves yes, we are alchemist yeah we okay all right now you're really good you're gonna love this because what i'm getting to share getting ready to share okay about some specific energy work and tools to use and why and a brand new, well, it came in on uh, actually June 11th of 2021. This year, I am keyword phrase, but related to this. Remember that word alchemist, okay? When we get there. All right, so let's go. Well, we've talked about why do you need to learn to do some advanced energy work? You need to learn to do energy work. You need to learn how to work with energy if you want to control your empathic abilities, to state it simply. Okay, that's step one. Now we're going to jump forward. Okay. So recently like last month was this was brought to my attention i'm going to tell you about what's known as fire the fireweed plant or fireweed tea also known as ivan tea ivan tea is the russian name for fireweed tea ivan i'm just reading you some information as we get going and ivan is the russian e name equivalent of the name John. Ivan, so therefore Ivan John means God is gracious. Right. Gracious, God. Okay, now God, yeah, that's a pro that's a word that a lot in this belief system have a problem with. I'm not, it's not one of my uh, favorite words simply because of all that's connected to it, all the connotations, all the misunderstandings and all that. So let's let's replace that in this moment, that word God with the Tao is gracious. 
The universe is gracious. The cosmos is gracious. Okay. So gracious means courteous, kind, pleasant. There's a generosity of spirit, a general sense of generosity that is not greedy. All right. Now, here's some, let's go. The fireweed plant is indigenous. indigenous sorry, that did not want to come out. Yeah. <laughs> The fireweed plant is indigenous to most of the Northern hemisphere and can be found in many countries. It is called fireweed because it is one of, if not the very first plant to come back after fire has destroyed an area. Now you cannot just go pick fireweed and brew it and call it Ivan tea, okay? Uh, and think you're drinking Ivan tea. Ivan tea, is the fireweed plant that has been fermented in a very particular way. It is a sacred shamanic ceremonial tea of ancient times and has powerful energies and beneficial physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual effects. The best Ivan tea and the one that I suggest is found only in Siberia and is harvested in the catchment area of Lake Baikal, which is under special protection of ecologists. The main reason for this Ivan T preference is because this is the area where the ancient future Atlantean pyramidal complex is located. It was Tutilaron of Atlantis, an aspect of self that I've been working with for several years, who told me of this complex almost 10 years ago. And I have been working with and leading others in working with in this ancient future Atlantean pyramidal complex for several years now. It's related directly to the 178 ATKI, which is directly related to um the dark the collective dark night of the soul that we're currently in like i said go back and listen to these previous chats that is directly related to the global pandemic we're currently experiencing all right so the use of ivan t from this area along with here's here's there's some stones involved here ruby and zoocyte and some other stones that i'll be sharing information on in a few minutes and specific energy work is powerful for energetic clearing of the 178 ATKI. All right. Um, about the, here's some a little more information about the Ivan T. Is an Ivan T is an ancient sacred shamanic ceremonial tea used by Siberian shamans for hundreds, possibly thousands of years. Some of its energetic energetic benefits are it removes anger and transmutes karma. It's specifically and or especially the 1910-1 karmic imbalance, which is all, another collective karmic imbalance that is currently coming into play for the collective consciousness of humanity related directly to the 17.8 ATKI. The 17.8 ATKI means Atlantean technology, karmic imbalance for those of you who aren't familiar once again, go back and listen to these previous chats for more detailed information on that, but it's directly related and directly responsible. I'm going to use that term loosely and generally there for the collective dark night of the soul that we're currently experiencing, which is feeding and has created this global pandemic. Okay, Ivan T helps release the fear of lack and therefore helps release and rebalance one's emotional insecurities that lead to acts and behaviors of greed for material possessions. There comes that temperance, that moderation, okay? All of that, that emotional insecurities that feed uncontrolled um, empathic abilities, I mean, see the connections here, okay? So 
it so let's go back helps release the fear of lack and therefore helps release and rebalance one's emotional insecurities that lead to acts and behaviors of greed for material possessions as well as the obsessive desire to control others in order to feel powerful it's currently happening on this planet it strengthens a connection to our higher self and spiritual guides and facilitates spiritual growth by aiding in the removal of energetic blockages we have set in place to safeguard our psyche. These safeguards were designed, were created and designed to keep uh, us, our psyche, from becoming overwhelmed and or injured by premature exposure to advanced knowledge and energies we do not fully understand and know how to handle and work with. Ivan T. assists in helping us focus in our studies, especially our spiritual studies, as we make our way towards being prepared to work with higher and higher knowledge and frequencies. As our understanding of knowledge and abilities of working with higher frequencies increases, often the safeguards we have set in place can be a bit difficult to remove or release because we, our human self, has become emotionally and mentally attached to them. And we have a difficult time letting go and moving past them. They have become our comfort zone boundary markers. So Ivan T, along with ruby and zoocyte and these other stones that I'm going to be talking about, assist greatly in the proper, in creating the proper energy field and consciousness shift to allow expansive personal growth at the rate and stage every individual is who uses them is prepared to access. So in other words, they work for every individual where they're at. They move in the moment, if you will. These tools must be utilized in the proper state of consciousness. In other words, knowing how to hold the correct energy of sacredness, once again, study and learn energy work properly. Or they become inert energetically. They become just another pile of superficial new age adornment. All right. Now, uh, I, I know both the other crones, I have a piece, but I didn't have time to dig it out and find it. Uh, but I know both the other crones have pieces of ruby and zoocyte. If y'all would one at a time show those so that people who may not be familiar, okay. Uh, That's mine. Beautiful piece. Yes. Okay. I want everyone to pay attention here. And you see that there's red, green, and those darker spots are black. Okay. It may be a little difficult to see, but there's black in there. Okay. Beautiful piece, Kabaha. Thank you. And Ariane? That's a lovely piece. I'm, I'm a little bit different. I actually have buttons made out of it. That is awesome. Those are there's so lots cool. of black in that one and the, the ruby. And right. I have another one here. And I constantly wear one with a mala that I made as well. So it's always there on my heart chakra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Um, all right. We're going to go on to the ruby. Oh, first of all, we're going to go back to the Ivan T because I shared energetic. Remember, you can't separate the physical from the spiritual. Hmm. Who said that? Where have I heard that before? Okay. Uh, so I shared a lot of information about the energetic benefits of Ivan T. Well, here are a few of the physical benefits of Ivan T. Well, it's caffeine free. So for those who have, you know, a caffeine intolerance and don't, you know, it's got no taurines, purine, uh, oxalic or uh, uric acids. It has 16, count them, 16 amino acids in it. Significant with, and significant amounts of micro, macronutrients such as potassium, sodium, calcium, and phosphorus. It's rich in vitamin B 
And so, and it has more C, vitamin C than a lemon. It's anti-inflammatory. It's an effective natural detoxifier. The bioflavonoids in this tea increases the activity of antioxidant enzymes in the small intestines, liver, lungs, and the, the small bowels, okay? So in other words, it does amazing work in even helping open and remove blockages in the energy meridians within, you know, physically in these uh, organs and these systems, but it helps open the energy meridians as well. Okay. All right. Here, it balances digestive health, boosts the immune system, improves mental concentration, increases energy levels, detoxifies the body, reduces inflammation, supports urinary systems health, uh, encourages new blood cell production, supports kidney health, normalizes blood pressure, relieves migraines and tension headaches, promotes relaxation and decreases tension and stress, improves the mood, helps with insomnia, strengthens circulation, and much more. It's a very powerful, sacred shamanic tea. All right, now onto the ruby and zoocyte. Ruby and zoocyte is also known as analyte. It's found only in uh, Tunisia. Okay, as you... Um, Kabaha, would you hold your piece back up? Eh, it's going to be a little hard. You're just going to have to um, let them see it once again. Cool. Is okay. that okay like that? Yes, that's perfect. Speak so it'll go back to you, the camera, please. Oh, okay. Here it is. <laughs> but you both need to. Okay. Thank you. That's good. I that's just wanted them to see one more time because I want to. The red, the, the ruby, the ruby is the red color. We'll show them again in just a second. Yeah. The zoocyte, okay, you so have to speak red. up. Yes, that's right. So you've got the red here, mm -hmm. the black, which is the okay. So the red is the ruby is the red. The zoocyte right. is green, which and the zoocyte is of the epido mineral group, mm -hmm. and the black is called hornblende. Mm. Yes, I mean, I mean, I must admit that's one of my favorite stoves mm. to work with, but the colors are quite amazing mm. when you look at them. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now, the reason I want you to understand here is because, okay, Ruby and Zoocyte. Now, this is all information that I've received um, for us to move forward here. Okay. The Ruby and Zoocyte is known as the stone of the, of the future of technology or the stone of future technology. The Ruby and Zoocyte, the energy frequency emits can be of tremendous assistance in guiding humanity in the proper use of advanced technology, using it for the benefit of humanity instead of misusing it in destructive ways. In this sense, it is a huge asset in working on the rebalancing of the collective karma of the 1788TKI. I was shown one of the most beneficial ways of using it is in the building of our physical world. This is going to make a lot more sense in a few minutes when I talk to you about, believe it or not, the black part, the horn blend. Okay. I was shown sacred geometric forms built into the walls and the fronts of buildings of higher knowledge institutes, universities, colleges, etc., and buildings of science and technology of all types in order to create an energetic space of technological integrity. Every specific combination of, and the sacred geometric form, so every specific combination of, there's five, there's five stones all together, okay, um, that are going to come into play. So ruby and zoocyte being the first one, and really the main one. I, 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 well, I really don't like saying it that way, but it was the first stone that came forward. It's the one that brought the information forward. Let's say it that way. 
So every specific combination of these five stones that I'm going to be talking about and the sacred geometric form they are used to create, creates a specific frequency and determines what and where it should be used and for what effect it is used for. Now I'm going to, okay. I want to talk about the horn blend. It's spelled H-O-R-N-B-L-E-N-D-E, -E, the black part found in the ruby and zoocyte. It is of, of major importance. What is horn blend? Horn blend is the most abundant mineral in a rock known as amphibolite. Am amphibolite. It's spelled A-M-P-H-I-B-O-L-I-T-E, amphibolite. Amphibolite is crushed and used for highway construction and as railroad ballast. It is cut for use as dimension stone. Dimension stone is stone that is cut and finished to specified sizes and shapes and used for buildings, monuments, paving, furniture, and decorative objects. Sometimes called cut stone, it is typically quarried in rectangular blocks then sawed and finished in specifications. Examples of different types of dimension stone are granite, limestone, marble, sandstone, and slate. Now remember, all of these dimension stones are, no, are types of amphibolite. And amphibolite, the most abundant mineral in it is hornblende. That's the black that's in the ruby and zoocyte, okay? The blocks and stones used to build the pyramids and other ancient structures would be considered dimension stones. So in other words, they are full of horn blend. Okay. The higher quality pieces, okay, of amphibolite, which has these massive, the most, the biggest, the most uh, abundant mineral in the amphibolite, this dimension stone is the horn blend, are cut, polished, and sold under the name black granite. And they're used for building faces, floor tiles, countertops, and other architectural uses. This is when I was told horn blend. So my guides said their, their words were, they said horn blend, that we should think of it this way. Horn blend is the glue that holds your physical reality together. And they're talking about in now but it can if we get conscious with this okay in creating our reality the physical remember you cannot separate the physical from the spiritual so even that doesn't mean just our physical bodies it means our physical reality even the buildings that we live in that we work in that we create in okay especially created with higher knowledge and science and technology. Okay. These five stones, all right? Ruby and zoocyte. The black granite, which is the high quality amphibolite. Terahertz. Terahertz is actually a man-made stone, okay? Technology, biology, and spirit. Shungite, amazingly powerful stone, also comes from Russia and Siberia, only place on the planet. Only stone known to us currently that has buckyballs, what are known as buckyballs, okay? We'll talk about that another time. And the stone that we've talked about in previous chats, Arkansas Clear Quartz Crystal. So the five stones in this set, ruby and zoocyte, black granite, aka amphibolite, terahertz, shungite, and Arkansas Clear Quartz Crystal are known as the stones of technological integrity. So why the black granite? The amphibolite, remember hornblende is the most abundant mineral in a rock known as amphibolite. And black granite is the name given to the higher quality of amphibolite. Amphibolite is crushed and used for highway construction and as railroad ballast and so many other ways in our physical reality, both minor and major. If you understand this, 
you can see why it would be called the glue that holds our physical reality together. These five stones, when used in conjunction with each other in specific proportions and creating specific sacred geometric patterns, create an specific energy fields of stabilization. There's our four frequency. There's that stabilization anchor point for advancing expansion of consciousness and illumination of sacred knowledge. Remember, just like we were told with the use of the ruby and zoocyte and the Ivan T, if the stones of technological integrity are not used properly, they become nothing more than another pile of superficial new age adornment. Now, two frequencies that and both of them are fairly new. The three, the first one is the 388 dual. This is related directly to the Ruby and Zoocyte and the Ivan T specifically, because these two things I'm suggesting personally, I've been using them myself and um, I, I suggest, and I recommend them. I recommend their use together. Okay. Um, but the, um, the 388 dual frequency, and it says, I am the act of creation in motion. I lay the sacred geometric path of potential reality experiences for all to traverse. The stability point of continuity and continuation, that 388, that creating that pathway that clearing of the pathway you might see it as, okay? The 388. And here's the one that I think is very exciting. This one actually came on, came in on the 11th of June with this information that I've just shared. It's the 4777. So the 4777 dual frequency. And it has a direct connection to the ruby and zoocyte, the horn blend, the five stones of technological integrity, and the Ivan T. All of this combined, okay? It says, I am the divine multidimensional alchemist. I am manifest in form to be of service. My existence is testament to the viability of the process of the synthesis of technology, biology, and spirit. We're creating this reality. We can either do it consciously or unconsciously. So far, the majority of humanity is creating reality unconsciously. Those who are creating reality consciously are still the minority. This is why chaos reigns. This is why those of us who believe ourselves to be manifest in form to be of service are here. To become these anchor points of stability, to open and clear and show a path of continuity and continuation that can be traversed We have tools at our disposal. We have ancient future knowledge coming back to us at unprecedented rates, but we also have chaos at unprecedented rates. But if you understand that chaos is simply an energy, if you learn to work with energy correctly, you learn to understand it and you realize and you know, and you learn how, that chaos works, it is 
actually a propulsion force and a stabilizing force for the creation of realities. then your work becomes much clearer. But step one, empath, step one is learning to control your empathic abilities. Because until you do, you're only adding to the chaos. Do you have to be perfect every day and every moment? No, but you have to try. You have to understand and take on the responsibility and the level of responsibility that you are capable of taking on. You have to make those conscious choices in every moment and not just in the easy moments. As a matter of fact, the, I'm gonna go out on a limb here just in this moment and say the easy moments don't count. You need to do it in the hard moments. been my honor to share with you all again um, amazing times we're living in as Madame Blavatsky once said to us it's magnificent chaos and magnificent chaos out of magnificent chaos can be created magnificence so Anything else that you other two ladies, other two crones would like to share here? Just one little thing, if I may. Um, yesterday, a phrase was given to me that was originally said by a person I know way back in the 1980s that has been run with, and it came back to me in a program that I was given to, to watch. And it's just struck me as being very appropriate. The phrase is, there is no more impenetrable fortress on the planet than a closed mind. Mm. Let's open our minds, be aware of what's around us and work with those energies and not closing ourselves down against them. Absolutely. Thank you. I can't agree more with that. And I think we're going to be more and more required to look at many things, energies and looking at the chaos and everything on this planet um, from a different perspective. I know some people are not willing to do it, but this is going to be an important part for the collective consciousness of humanity to move forward and create a new reality. That, that's going to be the only way. Thank you. Very well said, ladies, is amazing. I'm going to, I have one other thing I want to share, but I believe we're going to sort of use it as our um, ending, uh, really kind of as a meditative state to move out of this chat. So if you, uh, if the other two crones would like to go ahead and say their goodbyes, we will, as always, end the chat on, on silence. Uh, remember, we'll be watching this with you live in the live premiere uh, with an after chat. You'll have to, um, this is new. We'll, we'll do our best to get the, the, the link out to everyone who wants to join us in the after chat. But uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you very much. So um, till next time. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Wow, so much information to take on board. But uh, seriously, I hope, especially for the empath, we've shown you that it is possible to get out of that kind of vicious circle, feeling overwhelmed. And being an empath doesn't have doesn't have to be a curse. So I just hope the information is going to be useful for some of you. Thank you again. I just have to repeat there what Kobaha has said. After 60 years of living in fear of what I was not understanding was in my life, 
I have learned to work with it and I have learned that it truly is a gift, not something, not something to be feared, something to be worked with. It's one of the most amazing tools we have been given to understand our world. So I wish you well and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So if everyone would just find a quiet center, relax, and once again, consciously in your memory, bring yourself back into this sacred space we've been working within. It's a beautiful energy space. I want to read this last, share this one last message titled Secrets of the Masters and the Immortals. There are cycles across time that are known and held in memory by the masters and immortals. Cycles of experience that they know will be encountered and therefore endured by souls journeying through this or any dimension. The masters and immortals know what is to be expected and experienced when any collective mind arrives at certain stages in any dimension through this universal journey. They have experienced across eons of untold time, the course through this universal maze and therefore understand what growth opportunities or opportunities of entropy collective minds will encounter, what energies they will be bathed in during any specific stage, whether during a cosmic in-breath or a cosmic out-breath. Wisdom held by the masters and immortal, immortals is shared in whispers to be found floating across time and space on the cosmic winds. Wisdom that tells lesser minds of the truth that there is no reward and no punishment, no win, no loss, no beginning, nor no end. Wisdom that shares the knowledge that simple existence is the only experience that can be viewed as real. All else is but an illusion necessary for the experience of existence, for the delight, negentropy and uncertainty, predictability and randomness of the cosmic mind, the only source of consciousness within a multiverse, a multiverse that is beyond comprehension to even the most advanced collective mind. The masters and immortals know this universal journey is a journey of expansion and contraction, a journey of cosmic breath, an in-breath followed by an out-breath, followed by an in-breath, followed by an out-breath, and on and on and on. The wisdom of the masters and the immortals would speak to humanity of simply living each and every individual lifetime as fully as possible, of being conscious of the greater perspective of an infinite universal existence and experience and allowing the perceived self to flow through each life with ease grace and joy. The masters and immortals speak softly of the truth that to believe there is a destination of finality, an end of a journey that must be met or a prize of an unquestionable knowing or complete knowledge to be gained, especially in a single human lifetime is pure folly and a game of self-delusion. Follow the wisdom of the masters and the immortals and release yourself. 
your mind and your heart from the false task of attaining some self-imposed belief of completion. For beliefs such as this rob you of the true joy, bliss, and purpose of your soul. Para unche prana. I am the ancient future breath of life. Kara unche prana. Kara unche prana. Kara unche prana. Kara unch 